Hello, welcome to the new series of the Classical Top 5. Uh, we've had our summer break and we're back, ready, refreshed to get stuck into lots more subjects in classical music and reveal our passions, favourites, dislikes and downright hatreds. Uh, many of you still reeling from comments made in these shows about Bruckner, Walton, Sibelius. I wonder what will get you all going in the next few weeks. Can't wait to find out. Uh, thank you for all your subject suggestions as well. We'll be taking some of them up this season. Uh, if you haven't made a suggestion yet and have a top five subject that you'd like us to discuss, just comment on our Facebook page, uh, search for Classical Top Five, or use Twitter with the hashtag Classical Top Five. Do make sure you use the hashtag so I can see it. Uh, Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner are here with me via Zoom as always. Mm -hmm. Hello team, what have you been up to uh, since we've been off? Charlotte, what have you been up to? I had a break, I even went abroad, I went to Italy, but I think the biggest thing for me was actually something that happened a couple of weeks ago. I went to my first live indoors concert, oh, yes. um, not in Britain, but in Bremen, um, Germany, um, Quattro Modigliani, and it was incredibly moving. Um, and the thing that struck me most, I'm, I'd expected to have the tissues at the ready, but what it did it wasn't even the repertoire, it was the acoustic of the hall. Oh. It just hadn't occurred to me that if you have a string quartet and only 200 people in a hall that normally seats 1,400, the sound is completely different. And it, it was effectively a rehearsal acoustic, which is something that I love anyway and something that it always feels like a tremendous privilege privilege to be watching a great quartet or soloist perform in an empty hall before the concert later that evening yeah. but I wasn't prepared for hearing that intimate privileged sound in a public concert I have to say it really got me I think one of the one of the uh, comments that people have been making I mean particularly of course uh, after the proms uh, performances where there were no audiences at all is the is the rather lovely uh, absence of coughing and programs falling to the floor and people talking and mobile phones going off. And I think if you, if you halve the audience, you've halved your chances of any of those things happening as well. So you can actually hear tell the you, music. <laughs> tell you what, it is, you think coughing is a social faux pas in normal times. Coughing in a concert in <laughs> COVID times is right. absolutely terrible. <laughs> I had a cough stuck in my throat in about the first 30 seconds of this concert. And I just sat there, you know, tense, thinking I can't do it, I can't do it. And I swallowed it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> terrifying moment and what about you Richard I, I looking at uh, social media you've been very busy in your garden uh installing <laughs> model railways which look amazing <laughs> well yes yes as uh well if not now then when really you know it comes a time in any man's life when he has to have his own railway and um yes I mean I'm I think that's what Richard Branson of, said, wasn't it? <laughs> Anthony Vorjak, you know, Hetta Villa, Low Pass, many railway, um, <laughs> Ernest Moyer, and so many great, great music lovers and music musicians who, who love trains, and um, I'm certainly amongst them. So it's a, not time trains to be a great music musician. I'm certainly a great music lover. But, um, but no, like, um, um, like Charlotte, I was very lucky. I, I um, rather out of the blue, I, I managed to I blagged my way into the Lucerne Festival, um, mm. who pulled together a festival. They cancelled everything in April, like everyone did. And then the Swiss government relaxed um, their restrictions so much so by mid-July that basically I think they sat down and decided that actually let's put on a festival after all. In the space of about four weeks, they not only put together a programme that involved Igor Levitt and Herbert Blomstedt and Martha Argerich, um, as well as a Lucerne Festival Orchestra, um, but they managed to have a, a full audience. Um, I say a full audience, an audience of a thousand um, in a 2,000 seat venue. That's not bad going. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think my first instinct, of course, is to say, why couldn't the problems do this? Why aren't British orchestras doing this? So the answer, of course, is that the Lucerne Festival has got bloody squillions of dollars in the bank um, and <laughs> it lives and it's, it's in the middle of a gigantic tax haven um, where lots of famous musicians um, funnily enough have chosen to live um, <laughs> so it's actually not that hard to get hold of big stars very quickly if you have a lot of money and you have a lot of them living on the other doorstep that said it was absolutely wonderful um, Blomstedt 93 uh, standing bolt upright conducting the Eroica from memory um, like like it's a peer instrument on performance it was, it was fast it's crisp um it's lively and buoyant you know the players are absolutely on their toes you know you'd have thought this was some 27 year old conductor out to make a name for themselves by showing how historically aware they were and instead of this amazing 93 year old veteran and of course martha argrich seemed um like an absolute you know absolute strip of a girl next to <laughs> next to um uh, next to blomstead and it's lovely all beethoven program um, and everyone in the audience had to wear a mask 
there are a good thousand of us in there though and uh, we're all given branded lucerne festival masks again it's the kind of thing you can do when you've got the money and the style and the support the contacts to do that sort of thing um and we sat there and i have to say you're saying about the more annoying audience behaviors um there's certainly not much coughing going on but the chap sitting right next to me um was was sort of so moved by the occasion he sort of air conducted um, in the manner of the last month the proms <laughs> all the way through um no. Beethoven's <laughs> first piano concerto. Uh, so you know so did everybody did everybody wear a mask during the actual concert through all yes, the music the, 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 the performers were not wearing them and um, they are fairly spread out as, as, as they are nowadays but the the, cons, the the audience are required to wear them but on that basis they're allowed to have a thousand people in, in the concert hall and everyone but, sat there and um it being Switzerland, everyone was very polite, very, it was very organised. Um, we got beautifully made, beautifully designed masks with lovely cotton linings and wires over the nose mm-hmm. so you don't end up seeing me on your glasses. It was a class act and uh, I made sure I snaffled several of them on the way out so I can um, basically um, wind up other critics for the rest of the autumn season. I haven't been to any concerts at all, uh, uh, but the biggest event that happened here while we were away was our twins had their first birthday. Uh, and of course, that of course means that I don't have time to do anything else anyway. I did watch some of the proms on television, which of course were quite significant. I really enjoyed the Anushka Shankar prom because it was just something a little bit different. I love the performers involved in that. Uh, but I, to be honest, I didn't see as many as I, I really wanted to, but I know that it was a huge challenge for everyone involved. And uh, I think generally speaking, I've seen positives about it in the, in the press and on, on social media. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what comes out in the wash. But it's uh, certainly a, a, a very challenging time. But it's nice to see so many other um, orchestras and venues now starting to do a lot more streaming, which is really the only thing they can do to limited audiences. So I, mean, that, I think that's, that's got to be that's got to be good news. But let's let's move on to our subject today. That's the most important thing. And since it's the opening of the new series, our subject is top five opening bars in classical music. We did our top five endings a few months ago, as many of you will remember. So it's only natural to go to openings this time. And I wonder how we have found this. I, I went to a few, a few very quickly. And then I had a bit of a lull. I was thinking, oh, no, no. What else do I love? Uh, with what the openings? And what I think is quite interesting is that some of the ones that I've chosen are the same ones that I would have chosen or did choose in the, in the best endings. Um, obviously, these composers really know what they're doing. They start and finish brilliantly. Uh, uh, so, and I think that's absolutely the case with the reaction, huge reaction, again, that I got on, on Twitter when I asked the question, what are your favourite uh, greatest openings in classical music? So many of the choices were exactly the same choices as when I asked what were the great endings, which I think is very, very interesting. So, Charlotte, let's start with you. Well, like you, it was interesting trying to actually come up with uh, what is the definition of a great beginning? Um, What are the qualities that it should have? Mm. Um, But one that came pretty much instantly to my mind was the Sibelius Violin Concerto. Mm. Now, openings do not get much more spellbinding than this. It's quiet. It's not one of these big bang ones, but I think there are a few pieces of music that are so very evocative right at the start. Um, that scoring, that ethereal shimmering effect. Mm. Um, violins alone, I mean, right from the beginning, you're picturing a Finnish lake in the early morning mist with surrounded by dark forests containing who knows what and the mountains above. Um, but just what I love about it is how he has come up with that shimmering effect. I and mean, first of all, it's the violins alone split into multiple parts. But the piece of absolute genius is that they're all oscillating between notes of the D minor triad. But as mm-hmm. one group oscillates onto a note, the other oscillates off it. So the note stays the same, but it wavers. And you have this extraordinary static sparkling shimmering effect and then of course you've got this wonderful mysterious harmonically ambiguous violin floating over the top the low clarinet underneath and it's just a piece of magic and what I particularly love about this from a personal Sibelius perspective as well is that this was a guy who didn't get his dream of becoming a virtuoso violinist he'd just begun too late and he just didn't quite get there And rather than letting it put him off the violin for the rest of his life, he gifted the repertoire, he gifted violinists, orchestral violinists and solo violinists, one of the most magical openings in the Mm. entire concerto repertoire. Because of course that orchestral accompaniment is all violins, Um, the other instruments don't come in for a bit. So I I think that there's something very strong about what he did there. 
it's interesting you call the the violin the solo violin entry ambiguous i i never really thought of it that way what i quite like about it is that after the, it's a very brief shimmering in the strings and then the violin comes in and they and mm. with all great pieces just gets on with it there's the theme i'm getting on with it. <laughs> you know there, there's no real building up to it the violin just comes in with its theme i mean it's beautiful and it's quiet and and it is it is mysterious but it's not building up much to anything it's it's going straight in there with with a th- with one of the big themes isn't it so yes there is that but at the same time you're still in limbo land with it mm. um you don't know what key you're in that's really very unclear and, and i like that very much it, it it was suggested by a few other people on um on twitter as well that one and in fact when it came up i was thinking oh yeah actually you of course that wonderful mysterious shimmering yeah love that love that as a as a choice richard how about you i go to the opposite extreme you know was he sort of openings that kind of sort of magically sort of coalesce out of nothing out of the silence like the one Charles has just mentioned then there are the others which are just wham slaps you know slams yeah. you off your feet the very first bars knocks you for six sets the heart racing this it you're on board for a hell of a ride from the beginning and of course the absolute ultimate definitive one of those um I was going to say it was Richard Strauss's Don Juan um you know the opening it's so <laughs> iconic because it's actually in every single violinist audition pack in the world Indeed. you know yes. that opening flurry um yeah. which um i think um what does strauss say it's not actually difficult it's just just takes a lot of work he said <laughs> um i think when he first wrote it and um but there you go you know that uh, the flurry the sort of the way the the melody sweeps up is crowned by the trumpets um and then off you go and this kind of or- orchestral sort of orgasm um and then you sort of rock it away into the, um, you know, rock it away into into the piece, into you know, in, into this world. He's instantly created, you know, absolutely carried along on this surge of energy. And I, I was going to say that, um, but I mean, Richard Strauss did that. I mean, I mean that, that that's opening. I mean, he sort of got it so right that first time that so many people have imitated it. I mean, was yeah. Elgar's in the South is doing that. Um, there's, um, I think, a piece I mentioned in the last series um, by the Polish composer um, Karlovich um, does something very similar. Um, also, the um, Cyrenoids of Berzak, which by the Dutch composer Wagner. There's a list of these things that goes on. They all kind of begin with this flurry, the sort of triumphant fanfare, and swooping off. And, of course, Strauss himself repeated the formula throughout his career. He knew yes. he was on something. And I've got to say, the, the one that is special to me, the one that I love, the one that thrills me more than anything else, that tells me I'm in for an absolutely glorious four to five hours of my life is the opening of De Rosenkavalier, which yeah. he sort of is his spin on the same basic idea. Um, you know, the fanfare, the flurry, the sudden surge, the orgasmic surge of energy, and then sort of you're swept into this whole world. It's literally orgasmic, isn't it? Because Absolutely. I mean, that's it. I mean, I remember my music teacher used to give us, um, <laughs> when I was doing GCSE music at school, our music teacher would play us pieces blind to just you know blind unheard just to comment on to guess what's going on i never to this day i was 17 years old i will not forget the day he put the, the prelude to rosen cavalier on because i was actually i sat there blushing um because <laughs> i'd never heard this piece before it was so obvious i, was, I couldn't believe he's playing this in the classroom in school in front of <laughs> and, and, and we were just went to sit there and I thought, jesus you know you can't do that with music you know <laughs> is that allowed <laughs> you know and i went away i got the seat i got the LPs for the whole opera. I take them. I listen to them over and over again on my walk, and and that that was it. That's kind of where it all began for for, for me with opera, I would say. Um, and it's just um, every time you hear that opening sort of horn motif, and then that gorgeous sort of sensuous uh, response on the violins, and that great surge of sensuality and energy and sort of joy, um, you know you're in for one glorious evening you know you'll you'll know that you're in the absolutely brilliant hands and you're about to have the most wonderful time you've entered this fabulous sexy um thrillingly characterful new world when i was thinking about uh, all of these choices it, it occurred to me with uh, stuff that's in my world of film music you know all the great main title pieces throw you into the world of that film immediately and only the really great composers can do that effectively and it's extraordinary sometimes how well they can do that because it's all about the world of the film, this story, of course, but the atmosphere, the way it's shot, the colours, all that kind of thing that you can then manage to squeeze into music somehow. Which and and you know all the great ones, all the great main title writers like John Williams and um, uh, Danny Elfman is another one, and Jerry Goldsmith. All these people who are brilliant at, at making an atmosphere instant, and you think, I know where this film's going, or at least I know what this film is is going to be about or or like. Um, in a way, that's that's what so many of these composers of concert music are doing as well, aren't they? Throwing you into it immediately, whether it's 
really loud or, or incredibly quiet. I've chosen ones that are either one or the other. I don't think there, there, there is no, there's a, there are, I've chosen a few that are incredibly quiet and almost you don't notice they've started and others where you, you properly know. And in fact, my, my first choice is one I did put, I wanted to put it on uh, social media to get people going because I knew the um, classical music snobs hate this piece. Everyone else loves it, but it's Carmina Burana by Karl Orff, which of course has become an, a major cliche musically. Britain's Got Talent and shows like that on TV use it endlessly, which of course waters down the effect all the time. But you have to say it's one hell of an opening. It, does, it almost doesn't matter about the rest of the piece. It is obviously the most famous thing about the piece. And I love, the, I love all the piece actually anyway, but that opening is extraordinary because it grabs you by the throat instantly. It's loud, it's confident, it's exciting. And with the chorus going full pelt as well, I think it's brilliantly scored. Um, and I just, I don't know, there aren't many, there aren't any openings like Carmina Burana, are there? There, there wasn't before it and there haven't been any since really. It announces itself so brilliantly and so perfectly. Um, it's got to be in there, I think, as one of the great openings because also it just take, took on another life. Uh, didn't it? Everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in movies, it's on TV, it's, it's everywhere. And everyone knows it, even if they don't know what it is, they recognise it. So I think it has to be in a top five as one of the great openings. I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, it's not one of my favourite pieces, but I can see where you're coming from. You're right, I mean, it's instantly recognisable. I'm terribly, having grown up in the 80s, I associate it with aftershave and crashing waves, which, is, yeah. which is very, very sad. And I, can, <laughs> I can't listen to it now. I've sung it in choir and it was still what I was thinking. <laughs> so it, it does rather ruin it for me. <laughs> <to be laughs> Fair honest. enough. But, but that's what I mean, really. It's a shame, isn't it? Because it just becomes associated with so many other things. You forget what it really is, yeah. which is a piece of concert music. Um, and by the way, uh, I, I, I played a few times when I was a student, the cut down version of it, or, or cut down orchestration version, which is two pianos, percussion and choir. Um, and you'd think, because the, the power of the orchestra in that piece is, is fantastic, brilliantly orchestrated. And you'd think that stripping out everything except the two pianos and percussion, how could it possibly have the same power? But it really does, actually. It really does. I mean, it's, it's a very percussion and piano heavy piece, of course, anyway, in its fully orchestrated version. But actually, it still has that power, it still manages to make that massive statement up front. Shall we go back to Charlotte? Um, high impact, arresting, recognisable from the very first chord, let alone the very first bar or phrase, mm -hmm. El Garcho Concerto. Uh -huh. um, somebody had to mention it, so mm -hmm. it's going to be me. <laughs> um, it's, it's just the most extraordinary piece of music. And surely it is no accident that Jacqueline Dupre's most iconic recording was the Elgar and not, say, the Borjac, which is, of course, another wonderful concerto and another wonderful recording she did. But it doesn't have that opening bar. It doesn't have those opening five bars that just suck you in. I mean, they are emotionally shattering, absolutely shattering. It's just sheer blackness. And it must have been, you can, obviously, there are many reasons why the premiere didn't go quite to plan. There was Scriabin's poem of ecstasy to contend with and mm. that got far more rehearsal time and everyone was complaining that they couldn't hear the orchestra and that the orchestra didn't really know what they were doing and I'm quite sure that that was the case because the orchestration is very interesting and probably not what they were used to yeah, as well. Mm. But I think it is, it's very unusual. Interestingly on the orchestration um, he does a very similar thing to what Sibelius did. So with the Sibelius concerto, it's all violins, all in that range at the beginning. With the Elgar cello concerto, it's exactly the same. So that first opening chord from the soloist, there's a cello and a double bass sports sound chord and nothing else in the orchestra. And then you get just lower strings, isolated staccato quavers for the next five bars. He's doing something very similar. Um, which I think is very interesting, mm. um, very quiet. And I was thinking about what it is that makes this concerto such a favourite piece of music, because you would imagine something so emotionally shattering would just sap you of all energy and, you know, have you running for the door, but like, you know, um, Mahler's um, Kindertort indeed, why would anybody want to listen to that? Um, it's just too depressing, but you don't get that with the Elgar Cello Concerto. And I think the reason is it's the... Nobilmente direction at the top. You've got this blackness and this despair, 
but also this noble manner, the, the majesty, the grandeur with it. So in the midst of disaster, if you like, there is, there's a hero and you wonder whether that hero is going to be all right as a result. And of course, then he's so clever because we get to the end of the concerto and it comes back. And, you know, it just feels so right the moment that it's there. How often do you get the opening of a concerto appearing like two thirds of the way through the final movement? Um, and it just feels like this wonderful, right, cathartic release. Isn't it also the very basic uh, wonder of a broken chord on a string instrument? It always <laughs> sounds great when a, when a player plays that. I mean, Richard, you're a, you're a cellist. It, it's one of those very satisfying things, isn't it, to well, play and to listen to. It's like the Haydn's C major cello concerto mm. is another. He, he knows his string mm. instrument so well, Garvey. He's written a chord which is not difficult to play. You don't have to contort your fingers into any weird position. It just rings naturally over the instruments. It's one of those really satisfying chords. So instantly, the cellist is out there, reads the cellist, able to open up, be himself in those very first bars. Um, and then, I, I mean, really, I mean, until... Until you're into a scherzo, there's nothing really in that concerto which is technically difficult for the cello. So you have that entire first movement in which they can just sing, they can just be themselves, they can just express, they can just merge and find their place in the orchestra. And it's only really in the scherzo that things start getting seriously virtuosic in the conventional sense. And of course, that too is introduced. Right? I think Charlotte mentioned how it, the opening gesture comes back in the finale, which of course he also uses it to link into the scherzo, this time pizzicato. It's so adaptable. Um, it's such a brilliant piece of craftsmanship. Again, um, some of these Elgar's not given enough credit for. But I mean, I mean, Elgar, everything he wrote, I mean, has a slight, has a different kind of opening, and he and he, yeah. he he finds the right one for every kind. It'd be so different if you think of the the violin concerto, this big romantic symphonic opening movement, this grand romantic concerto on the biggest scale, and then the cello concerto, this sort of intimate soliloquy that begins in this kind of broken solitary way at the beginning um the absolute contrast of these two works and it's the same with the two symphonies how very very differently they both are. Yeah. And, you know one of them just this march emerging from silence and the other was sweeping off on this great torrent of sound the second symphony well of I, course well, would... although there's a lot of yes it's not technically difficult perhaps um in the first movement but there's an awful lot that the cellist has to do instead there's tension how do you have that piercing intensity the tone that has to carry the audience through. I mean, there's, if, if you sit and listen to a masterclass on the Elgar Cello Concerto, you're not left at the end of the first movement thinking, ah, oh, that wasn't so different, that wasn't so hard, really. In a way, the recording industry spoils that opening a little bit in that when you listen to it and you listen to it in volume, it's incredibly powerful, that big chord at the beginning with the cello. Um, and then when, if you happen to be at the back of the Royal Albert Hall when it's being played, <laughs> There's a, it, it can be rather underwhelming because you're yeah. used to that big sound that a cello can make when you're up close and personal with it or indeed listening, listening to recording. But in, in a hall, when you're miles away, it, it, can, it, it, lose, it can lose its power. But of course, that's, I think that's the case with a lot of the orchestration in that piece. I mean, the violas that take up the main theme right at the very beginning or just after that, that, that opening, um, I've always found to be quite weak. But then again, it's sort of... It's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be brittle. It's supposed to be, uh, you know, you're supposed to stretch yourself a little bit to hear it, I think. But so it's, in the end, it's actually quite clever orchestration, I guess. But yeah, I, it's, I think this is often the case with, with orchestral performance now that, that you get so used to, to recording, you get so used to listening to it on great, you know, on your, in your earphones or on great equipment. And then you get to a hall and if you happen to not be in quite the right place in the hall, it can be rather an underwhelming experience. Elgar Cello, uh, <laughs> another great, great choice. Richard? Another one from you? Um, right. Well, um, there's various composers for whom I just have to the list for each one because it's, you know, who's <laughs> which of these great ideas are you going to choose? I mean, Wagner was one. Uh, Mozart was another. Um, I mean, it's already about creating a world opera, starting an opera or a film star. Um, and how I mean, Mozart, certainly in his mature operas, always does that every single time. You think he mm. the overtures with mature operas just perfectly creates a world. Um, you know, the opening D minor chord of Don Giovanni, a great tragic chord. Um, Magic Flute, The Solemnity, and then Figaro, which I think, I, I, that, that is the, the greatest overture of all time. It's the greatest <laughs> opening of any opera ever, surely, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, there it is, just 
all, the energy, the comedy, the playfulness, the tenderness, all of it there, just four minutes of music. Um, and not one note of that stuff comes back in the opera, does it? He just throws it away. And he just perfectly sums up the opera without using anything that's actually in the opera. And there it is. And, um, and, and, and you know, and it doesn't get better than the figure overture, does it? So, I mean, it's... Um, emerging out of nothing, coming out of the shadows, suddenly something, something's moving, and then suddenly it all bursts in on you, and, and, and you're in this world, this bustling, teeming, joyous world. Yeah, Mozart mentioned a lot of times on, uh, on the suggestions on social media. Uh, Figaro, I think, has to be the most mentioned of, of the Mozarts. Um, we had some, a lot of very interesting suggestions, actually. Um, we had Vaughan Williams' Fifth Symphony, Vaughan Williams' Sixth Symphony uh, suggested, uh, Rachmaninoff, Rhapsody on the theme of Paganini, which is it's just those pizzicato strings, isn't it? Uh, um, Rhapsody in Blue, which is not one of my choices, but I think absolutely has to be, it in there, doesn't it? Because it's just such a famous, I mean, such a unique opening, getting that, that clarinet. And there's all that debate about whether he really meant it to be a slide up to that top note, really, or whether he really meant it to be a run of notes up there as well. Um, fascinating uh, little debate that but of course you know again it's one of those pieces that immediately conjures up the piece gets you started uh, exactly where you need to be with the sound world of, uh, of that piece um, yeah there's lots of really interesting um, um, suggestions uh, what else have we got here Beethoven 9 Brahms 1 Brahms was actually another one that a lot of people mention uh, as being uh, uh, like so Brahms 1 Brahms 4 um, and of course, Marla is in there. Now, has anyone, has any, either of you two chosen any Marla as your great opening? No. Because uh, I, I haven't either. Although Marla 5 is, I think, probably my favourite of the Marla openings. But lots of people, I, essentially, as always with Marla, you could, I think you can ask almost any question and people will choose a Marla symphony, but they'll all choose different ones. <laughs> um, so some people said Marla one, some two, three, four, I mean, basically all the Marlas, everyone thinks uh, start really, really well, everyone has their own favorite. I like five because it's so stark and because you know, I love trumpets and there have been some wonderful trumpet players who've done that opening. I've heard some where they've really buggered it up. And you know, that means you, you just sit there with you, on the edge of your seat, hoping, hoping, hoping that they're gonna, get it right because it's such an exposed opening of course. I'm reminded of a wonderful story that Michael Tilson Thomas told about doing Marla 5 in um, Japan I think it was on tour with the LSO and it was um, Maurice Murphy playing the trumpet and um, they were very very uh, jet lagged. They hadn't really rehearsed very much. Maurice was a, is a legendary player of course. He started playing, he went da 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 and when he hit the next note da 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 there was an earthquake and they all had to stop. And MTT said, you know, man, Morris, I, I know you're a powerful player, but that, that's something <laughs> to be able to start an earthquake. So I always think of that. That is one hell of an opening. But oh, of course, Marla 8 is an amazing opening, isn't it? Arresting, huge. Um, you just, you, you can't take your ears off it. Um, I just have a problem with the rest of the piece. So it's one of those pieces where I love the opening. And then I just think, okay, great opening. Now I'll move on to something else. Uh, and in fact, that, that's a common uh, thing with a lot of the pieces I was thinking of, is I really love the opening, but then I can leave it from there. Um, I don't know, many, many reasons why that would be the case. Um, my, my next choice is an incredibly quiet one, and it's a piece actually I've, I think I've chosen before in this series, but it's Ligeti's Atmosphere, because it's one of those pieces that you almost aren't aware has started. It's a block chord of many, many notes, across the orchestra um, in a piece that is really just about color from the different sections of the orchestra, a very special piece. Um, I remember seeing a, a performance of it with the uh, LPO, the, the London Philharmonic Orchestra at the Festival Hall, in an amazing program actually, which started with um, Vaughan Williams' Eighth Symphony. No one starts a concert with Vaughan Williams' Eighth Symphony. Then there was a new piece by Mark Anthony Turnage. And then after the break, they did Atmosphere by Ligeti, running into, without a break, the Rite of Spring, which is another one of my choices. Now, I've never heard it, it do it that way, and it, it almost worked. It's, an, it's, it's one of those ones that sounds like a great idea, and it almost worked, um, because out of that extraordinary ending to that atmosphere, which just sort of melts away, then you had that bassoon 
suspending that note at the beginning of Rise of Spring. And it was quite a moment. I'm, I'm not totally convinced by, by, by the idea of doing that because neither piece was meant to be together. But it's an, it's an interesting way of programming uh, pieces. And uh, I like those kinds of experiments. But for me, I, what I love about Ligeti, again, is he throws you into that world immediately. But with atmosphere, of course, he does it so quietly that you really have to strain to, to realize that it's, that it's started. And I love that. And the color is so gorgeous. It's so arresting. Um, delicious colouring in throughout the whole piece, but particularly that that beginning. So that's one of my beginnings. I'll come back to to the writer's spring because I think that's a whole other conversation. But uh, Charlotte, back to you. Let's go back to opera, and I almost picked the marriage of Figaro, very very almost. But in the end, I went for one not that throws it all away, but that gives you a action packed surprise, a second trailer for the opera. Janáček's Katya Kabanova. Um, I absolutely love this piece. And in terms of pieces that, I mean, like Ligeti, starting with the power of silence, um, that's what you have at the opening of this particular opera, this study intention, the, the brooding stillness, funeral, um, the ominous bell tolls in the timpani, the rising forth that's going to be everywhere. And, and then you have this, you know, wonderful, increasingly frantic rising circles in the strings. And then when you're just not sure what's happening and there's tension and you're not sure whether it's stopping or starting, suddenly you're plunged into this kind of intensely beautiful sleigh ride, but you know it's the sleigh ride to doom and disaster and you mm. can't get off it. And I just, it's just absolutely incredible. And then of course the trumpet warning fanfares come, this urgent crescendo and then the flutterings of strings and if you listen if you're listening to the Macarius recording the cadence at two minutes and eight seconds in it never fails to send a shiver down my spine um, and yeah. everything is so carefully mentioned out and then of course you have that love music the prominent harp and I think perhaps what it is that makes all of this so emotionally potent he was in love when he wrote it with Moves that would inspire the vixen as well in Macropolis. And it sounds like ardent, triumphant love music, even though you know it's going to all end in the vulgar at the end of it. Hmm. And it's honestly, after the overture, the opera is always a massive um, disappointment to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> just stop and make them play the overture <laughs> we've got to the end of it. But yeah. I mean, it, it's ravishingly beautiful, emotionally potent music. And, and yes, this, this sleigh ride to hell that yet sounds beautiful. Janáček's most famous piece, the Sinfonietta, is one that's also mentioned many times by people uh, on social media. And it was, gonna, it was almost one of my choices, uh, the famous fanfare that start, the brass fanfare, brass and timps fanfare that starts Sinfonietta. Um, again, is the most famous part of the piece, but unlike you with the opera, Charlotte, I, I love the whole piece of Sinfonietta. I mean, it's a masterpiece. And, and again, you know, when it comes, when that fanfare comes back at the end of the piece as well, that's a real spine tingling moment. And to think it's such a vibrant, youthful piece written by someone near the end of his life, absolutely mm. extraordinary. Um, but yeah, that was, the Sinfonietta was another very, very popular choice. I guess it's, you know, it's a fanfare. So fanfares are always going to be popular starters to, to, to pieces. Um, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Richard, another choice? Um, well, this is this is one I absolutely had to get in. Um, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't let this one slip by. I think it's the first piece of classical music I ever fell in love with. The first piece I ever loved as as, as a little kid. Um, basically, absolute silence. I mean, there's just tremolo tremolo violins at the very heart peak of their register. And then again, so that's just a horn plays the first three notes of a D major arpeggio. That's it. Instantly, you're in a world. Instantly, you know it can be over the piece. It's the blue down. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the simplest devices in the whole world of classical music, just a, a triad, um, some violins and a horn, and you created a world instantly recognisable. I, I call that absolute bloody genius, and whatever anyone else says. And and then the way it goes from there, the sort of acceleration, the building of tension, the sort of um, the the tenderness, the release, um, and and you know the, the extreme melodies that follows. I mean, it's just one of those pieces that does so much or so very very little just creates this world of absolute bare economy of means and it could be by nothing else by no one else by no other composer no other piece and no other time in history um and it's i mean it's familiarity breeds contempt perhaps for me but i mean i know a lot of people do prefer not take this stuff as seriously as it 
deserves. I mean, I mean, Stanley Kubrick knew it is. He, he needed a musical symbol to sum up the whole of human civilization at this <laughs> point in time. The 2001 A Space Odyssey, and, and that piece just did it instantly yeah. without any effort at all, better than anything that any film composer who he hung up could have done. He just put it on the soundtrack and nothing could have been more right. Um, it's, it's our whole civilization, it's a whole of Western music distilled down to a few bars of, of just beauty. And um, I, will, I will fight anyone who disagrees with me on that. I just think it's <laughs> at one of the, the all-time great, great openings in classical I music. Totally, totally agree with you, Richard. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of, of that. I mean, I, I was about to say that kind of music is incredibly unfair because what really does that mean? But I, I, uh, I agree, totally agree with you. Any piece that can, can conjure something up instantly like that has to be worth um, talking about because uh, it's not easy to do that. I think a lot of composers have struggled uh, through a lifetime of being able to, to, to have a stamp that's that um, unique. Uh, I guess most composers look for it and they don't always find it, but uh, certainly Blue Danube is one of those pieces that, that does that brilliantly. Um, I'm going to bring in one that's, that's pretty much the opposite to the Blue Danube and also opposite um, to Ligeti Atmosphere, although it, it starts actually with a similar device, which is um, a huge number of, of what seem like random notes played together. And that's the opening of Penderecki's Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima, because... I don't know whether there is a more arresting opening to a piece than that. In the score, when you look at it, it's not quite as detailed, actually, uh, I discover, as I imagined it would be. I thought it would be fully scored out, but actually I think it's more, more about the direction of uh, 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 telling strings to just play something in a particular way. Um, it's incredibly harsh. It comes straight in. It's just strings, uh, high, high up on the registers of all, the, all of the strings. And it sounds cacophonous and it sounds horrible and it sounds moving and extraordinary. There really is no other sound like it. And I love it. And it just makes anything that else that's happening around you stop. Uh, and in fact, I've played it in the room with my baby children and they are absolutely terrified by it. I mean, they do not know what on earth it is. And I think that's probably a, a reaction that, that that's fine by Penderecki. Um, of course, this is an incredibly moving piece. I mean, he, he retrospectively called it Threnody to the Victims of, of Hiroshima as it happens. Um, but I think, it, you know, listening to it, you can see why he would, uh, he would conjure up that, that memory to this piece. Um, it's, it's a very moving piece, I think. It's, it's again, full of colour, but it's a colour that isn't always that satisfying. It, it, it's, it's, I, I think some people would say that it's like fingers down, down a blackboard, but in a good way. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be that. It's supposed to make your ears bleed a bit. Um, I love that. And again, I choose it because there really is nothing else in music like it. I love it when composers do that, when they, when they make you stop in your tracks with a moment in music. And if it's at the beginning, even better. Um, so that's another one of my, my top five, the threnody to the, Victims of Hiroshima by Penderecki. Uh, let's go back to Charlotte. Let's move on. I'm going to give you next what I chose instead of the Rite of Spring, because these were the two I was wavering between. And it's actually another dead maiden. It is Death and the Maiden. Yeah. And another, another high impact, instantly recognisable opening. There is a reason why it's one of the pillars of the chamber repertoire. You know, those first five notes... Um, absolutely extraordinary and what I find particularly fascinating about this particular piece I've actually got the score open in front of me is that just a little bit last season last series we talked about Beethoven 4 the fourth piano concerto and you look at those first few bars in the piano and you think well what the hell how, how do I play that um how does Beethoven want me to play it and that's exactly what you've got here the different range of options is is absolutely dizzying I mean how much air do you put between that opening um, dotted minimum and the triplets that follow um, do you go straight into it is there any air how much air then how do you use the silences how do you make sure that there is still silence and then all of these accents the little um, the little mini hairpin accents now in Schubert they can mean a sharp accent or they can mean just a change of color or inflection so which a which in this and then he's also got those little dagger shaped accents which kind of indicate um 
tension uh, sort of lifted up in the air. And sometimes he's put a hairpin accent and a dagger accent on the same note. So what do you do with that? And, and then the silences, do you stretch them out or do you keep them absolutely bang on the beat? And it's just this accent and decision smorgasbord. And it was really interesting. When I thought of putting this as one of my choices, I actually did a quick um, streaming. I went through various recordings and just listened to that opening bar from, you know, various the Amadeus, the Emerson, um, loads of different quartets. And it was interesting how different every single one was. And although you get that with recordings in general, not quite to the extremes that I think you do with Death and the Maiden. And, and of course, also the, you have these extremes of dynamics from fortissimo to pianissimo. And it's how extreme do you make those? <laughs> That's a great choice. Um, has anyone chosen Beethoven 5, the single most famous opening bars in history? They haven't, oh, have they? I almost you haven't, did. have you, Charlotte? You haven't either, have you, Richard? And neither it was I. it was on my potentials, but no. So it has to be there, doesn't it? Because mm. it, it is the most famous opening, and everybody knows it. Everybody, the man on the street, knows those opening four notes. They may not even know what it is or who wrote it, but they yeah. they know it. Um, and uh, so it, they, it has to be in there somewhere, even if it's not in our own personal top fives, doesn't it? Um, because that, that's another one that came up a lot on, on uh, social media. Um, I was just looking through at other ones that, that came up. Um, Charlotte, there's a, a Verdi Otello. Actually, Verdi comes up a lot, uh, at some arresting openings. I'm assuming they're really talking about the overtures. Um, somebody mentioned the opening of the first sea interlude from Peter Grimes. But of course, that's not strictly mm. speaking the opening of the, of the opera itself, is it? Because uh, the opera itself starts actually in the, in the courtroom before we go to one of the interludes. But I, I thought I'd let them get away with, with, with that one. Um, I was wondering whether there are some others we should mention sort of quickly before we come back to our, to our main choices. Another one I had in here was um, Martineau's First Symphony. I don't know whether you, you know that, but it, um, I love Martineau as, as a composer, but Symphony Number no. 1 starts with these sort of great slides up the register through the orchestra. So it starts with a chord, which then has a big run up, nice slow run all the way up the orchestra, um, up to another chord, and, and so on in its, in its opening. And it's, a, again, a very arresting opening, very um, atmospheric, and it makes you think, oh, well, what's this? What's going on? But it, uh, then, once it's done that, it sort of goes off into what, I suppose you could say is much more conventional material. Uh, and again, it's, it's material that I, I'm less interested in, um, but I love the opening. So I can listen to the opening all day long, but then I sort of tail off in my, in my interest, but it's a fabulous opening. I would recommend it to, to, to people. Um, and another one I nearly chose, because uh, it's one of my favorite pieces anyway, is um, Messiaen's Turangalila Symphony. Again, sort of launching straight into this world that he's, he's um, He's going to give you for the next <coughs> minutes or whatever it is. Um, really going for it on the on the cellos, the basses, and throws you into it. I love that opening uh, because really there's no let up from that from that moment when when he starts. Um, that's another big favourite of mine. Are there are there others, Charlotte, that didn't quite make the list that you could think of? You just throw in here. Uh, well, I I was a little bit disappointed at myself for not putting anything baroque in. I haven't in the end. <laughs> Um, but I was really seriously considering Handel's Messiah, actually mm -hmm. any of Handel's opera um, overtures. I think they're wonderful mm -hmm. stuff. Handel knew how to put on a good show. And so there was that. And also from that perspective, Sadoc the Priest as well. Um, so I think Handel really knew how to open strongly. I mean, Zadok, so, uh, Zadok the Priest. Pieces. Uh, I think Zadok the Priest. I mean, I, I can't believe I, I completely forgotten about Zadok the Priest. <laughs> of course, that's, that's an incredible opening, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's, mm. It's the build up, the build up, the build up, the sense of the anticipation, and then bam. And then kapow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. Goodness. I mean, this is the trouble with this program. You just completely forget some of the really, really obvious ones, don't you? Um, where are we? Uh, Richard, what's, what's your next choice? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I mentioned um, Richard Wagner earlier. I mean, I don't see how we can really not have, have him come up in the whole thing. I mean, I mean imagine you know, the beginning of Rheingold. 
<laughs> people would like to i know but you can't he's out there and um and he's bigger than any of us and it's i mean i think of it at the beginning of ryan gold i mean there we go it's, he's creating a universe really setting an entire world in motion and again it's the most primal musical elements like i said earlier at the blue danube uh this low e flat and then these building triads he, he's just basically putting a world together from the raw elements of music and this has got to be broad enough and big enough and, and huge enough and generate enough momentum to sustain this whole thing for the whole 16 hour drama till it finally resolves into i think it's d flat at the very end isn't it um um the very end of gus demeron and i mean god i mean i mean that is and there, there you are you're in the theater the lights are down it's dark everything is in black and there's this low rumble at the bottom of the orchestra this is like the birth of music there's something very very primal about it um at the same time so incredibly beautiful i mean um, um mark twain i think when he went to bayreuth made made a comment about how he's you know he's just huge cynical wagner skeptic and then he sat down in the dark and his hum began um and so he said the, and the long dead conjurer began to weave a spell all over again and you, you're just sucked in um how often do you hear a composer creating a world before your ears um setting <laughs> the whole universe in motion the world spinning i mean that's and that's what he does there um often imitated never equals right i'm going to bring in the rite of spring because again totally unique beginning and essentially surely one of the most important first bars in the history of music because it helped change everything in the 20th century i think there's so much can be talked about about what is the point you know we did another one that was suggested debussy l'après midi uh, d'un fond which of course starts chromatically on the flute which is incredibly important and i know in paul griffiths's uh, famous book about modern music he cites that as really the beginning of uh, of of orchestral chromaticism and therefore modernism in music and of course that's true but the, the sheer cultural and musical impact of Rite of Spring can't be ignored and it really does come down in a way to that first bar and of course there's the famous stories about the riots and everything but it seems to me that that it was actually that first bar that started it started it off literally started it off people objected from the very beginning they'd never heard anything like that before i mean I, the firebird is another great opening of course another one where you almost don't realize it started with that the rumble of the basses um doing doing their their bit and that's a fabulous very very atmospheric beginning to 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 a ballet but that first note i mean you could perhaps even bring it down to just that first note of the Rite of Spring as being just about the most important single note in, in music from that moment onwards, um, because it's high up in the register for the bassoon. It's, like, it, it's just at that difficult point. It's always gonna be a pressure gig for the bassoonist, um, however great they are, because everybody knows it's coming. Um, but there aren't many pieces. I mean, we've discussed a few about the sort of color and orchestration that, can, that, that starts off a piece, but just one note from one instrument conjuring up an entire piece just like that that's an extraordinary uh, thing and uh, i don't know i to me it's inarguable right of spring opening bar has to be in the top five of the greatest openings of all time did anyone else oh, you didn't you nearly chose it didn't you charlotte so you nearly yeah. chose it i nearly chose it. and funnily in the same thinking also as thinking you know single notes that you don't have to hear anything else just a note not a chord and of course debussy's um la pre de la primidie d'un faune is c sharp isn't it um i don't have the score in front of me but that c sharp from the flute instantly you know yeah. what's coming with that as well um, yeah. it's absolutely extraordinary that a piece can do that so briefly, another, another choice from you, Charlotte. Have, this is my last one. Okay, great. And it's the piece that pipped Sadok the Priest to the post. Um, I wanted something unashamedly feel good. I suppose this is my answer to your coming to Burano. And I feel slightly embarrassed about it, but not really. Never feel Parry, like. Parry, I was glad. Um, it just, it does what it says on the tin. <laughs> it's just feel good tingle factor don't care how uncool it is we have antiphonal choirs brass fanfares orchestra timps organ in choral terms this is a banger and <laughs> what i love about it also is just the, the bass welly of the orchestra that then just kind of 
growls underneath everything else as the ethereal choral singing gets going. And what I find really great about this one is that Parry didn't get the opening right first time. This is, of course, the choral setting of Psalm 122 that gets wheeled out for the coronations of kings and queens of England. So Parry was first invited to do it in 1902 for the coronation of King Edward. And then he was asked to do it again in 1911 for King George. And he changed the opening. He felt they hadn't quite hit it right um, for the first time around. And I believe, um, maybe people would correct me with this, I believe that it, he actually put the introduction on. Um, so that first introduction that we hear is what he comes up with in 1911. Um, and of course, it's just feel good perfection. It's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. And, and of course, it's also when the choir come in, it's one of those sort of nemesis of... Um, amateur choirs because of course you've got the t so i feel i i was glad when they said um t -t 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 to me it's a absolute car crash moment potentially for every single amateur choir that does it and it was actually amateur choral singing that first introduced me to it because it was um a school performance my music teacher had it sung at his wedding and he loved this piece and so that was my first experience of it so it's got sentimental um attachments to me for that reason as well but mm, i just love it it's happy <laughs> nothing wrong with happy absolutely not no. especially, especially at this time uh richard <laughs> richard finish uh finish your choices um well um i was uh, I, 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 I thought no one's going to mention any cave music until Charlotte class in there mm -hmm. on Death of the Maiden. Because um, we've talked so much about colour, haven't we, and about sort of effects, big, big gestures with orchestras. And it's hard to do that with a string quartet. And I mean, Haydn, pretty much every time he opens a quartet, always banging on about Haydn, I know. Every time he opens a quartet, he just sets things up perfectly. Um, often, you know, just one bar, one phrase, and you're off. And um, the one I chose out of all of them, um, because there are so many that are brilliant, is just the opening of the, the Lark Quartet, Opera 64 number five mm. in D major and just because right there you've got a little little teeny crisp little marching motif little rhythm um at the bottom of the quartet um just answering each other so you immediately got conversation you've got wit you've got rhythmic definition and then over the top of this this glorious serene violin melody exact opposite you've got streams of the ensemble two extremes of musical possibility in the piece just laid out there so simple and so brilliantly at the beginning and again you know where is he where is he going to go with it you, you, it's it's fantastic where he goes anything's possible once he's sort of set up those opposites um, and made them fit together so brilliantly and just those very first parts it's just a delight every time and of course you can never take it too seriously it sounds beautiful but um it also um sounds playful and i think that's that's again something something special my final choice is another obvious one i guess but i've chosen it for a number of different reasons uh, and that's the main title music to Star Wars, the original, by John Williams. Mm. And the reason I, I've chosen it is, A, I mean, it is a, one of those just instantly recognisable pieces, of course, one of the most famous pieces in the world now, I suppose. Certainly one of the most performed uh, by orchestras all over the world. Um, I've chosen it because I, w I remember seeing the, uh, the original film when it came out. I was very young but you never forget, no one, millions of people all over the world never forget where they were when they first heard that music. Uh, it's, it was so thrilling, apart from anything else, but also I then discover as I, as I get to know film music more and start studying it, of course, it was an incredibly important moment for orchestras in film music. Even though Williams, people like that, had used orchestras uh, up um, in the 70s, on other films, so Jaws was before that, for example. Really, in big mainstream movies, the orchestra had kind of disappeared a bit in the mid-60s uh, in favour of more contemporary and pop music uh, and pop-style pop scores. But what Star Wars does is it heralds that whole new era, if you can call it that, because obviously it's based on the old era of the classical orchestra coming right back front and centre to uh, to, to, to big movies. So it was a very, very important moment in movies, but also just frankly, a very, very important moment for lots and lots of young children, young and old children, <laughs> that is, uh, in, in the movies. And also I chose it because the, I've, I've presented literally hundreds of concerts where, we've, where we have performed that piece and to see the faces of the people when you play it. I've been to the Hollywood Bowl a number of times where John Williams has conducted it, you see 16,000 people 
cheering like you've never heard them cheer anything before. They all hold up their lightsabers. It's dark. It's an amazing sight. They're all sitting there, all waiting for Star Wars. It doesn't, almost doesn't matter what else he plays in the concert. They're waiting for Star Wars. It just brings joy to people. It is a fabulous piece of music, brilliantly written, incredibly hard to play, which a lot of musicians forget when they first get it in front of them. It's just a fabulous piece of music. What else can you say? But it's that fanfare at the beginning that heralds the beginning, not just of great music, but also, of course, of you know, one of the greatest of all film franchises. So uh, I, I thought Star Wars needed to be in there. Um, we've run out of time. Uh, uh, just throw me a couple of others that you think should definitely be mentioned. Charlotte? Oh, well, funnily, oh. I was... Um, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, you, yeah. Funnily, mentioning John Williams, of course, the other film score that is just absolute genius is Jaws. Mm -hmm. um, those, those notes, uh, the, the, the Jaws notes. And particularly, if, if you know anything about classical music, then, of course, the moment you have that first underwater scene and the... the um, the low woodwind is starting, you're in writer's spring territory, you know what's coming, even if you don't know what the film is called. Mm -hmm. And that for me is uh, brilliant. Yeah, Richard, any more we should mention? Um, well, um, Mitch mentioned Richard Strauss earlier, different, si different side of Richard Strauss, and it's La Fine L'Opera Capriccio, which ends with a, opens with a string sextet playing live on stage, um, mm -hmm. just, just chain music. Well, just want to give a quick shout out to the person on Facebook who mentioned Sh uh, Schumann's concert stuck. Uh, for Four Horns and Orchestra, what a knockout piece and what a knockout opening. Um, Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony, that piece makes me feel happier instantly the minute it springs into life. Um, and also Schumann's Third Symphony, the Rhenish Name, which is an old favourite of mine. Um, and uh, uh, the sort of sweep for the grandeur, the sort of sense that you're off on a grand symphonic adventure that he sort of conveys in those bars, those syncopated opening bars. Um, again, um, terrific. Um, I, again, it always always gets me um, sort of in the mood. <laughs> and I'm going to throw in, finally, Nielsen's Fourth Symphony, uh, another one of those pieces that doesn't bother with an introduction. It just gets straight on with it. Boom, straight in. Uh, I played it in youth orchestra many, many years ago uh, when the leader was one Michael Seal, who's now famous conductor and he was the one uh, who suggested this piece actually on on Facebook and I'm in total agreement with him it's a fabulous opening sends you again straight into that world without any messing about whatsoever oh lots and lots of wonderful suggestions um of course we want to hear everybody else's suggestions as well uh, on either on Facebook on our Facebook page or on uh, Twitter so please do keep those uh, ideas coming in and as I said at the beginning, please do keep your ideas coming in for what subjects you'd like us to, to discuss and maybe some special guests you'd like to uh, hear from. We've uh, had some incredible guests uh, on the Classical Top 5 so far and we're looking forward to a lot more. And on that subject, uh, we have a Classical Top 5 special, an extra, uh, which will be uh, available later as well. And that is an exclusive interview with the great flautist, Sir James Galway, one of the world's most famous musicians, most popular musicians. I'm going to be talking to him about his top five uh, favourite people he's collaborated with uh, and performed with. And of course, we mustn't forget that he was once principal flute of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra under Herbert von Karajan. So it would be very interesting to see whether Karajan is one of his top five choices. I shall certainly be talking to him about that and about all of his uh, orchestral playing uh, earlier in his career. So look out for that. Looking forward to, uh, to speaking to Jimmy Galway. All right. So thank you very much to Charlotte. Thank you very much to Richard. Thank you all for listening. And next week, we're going to talk about the top five operas written before 1900. What are your ideas on that one? <laughs> we're looking forward to hearing them. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>